Have you guys ever longed for something more or something better than what you have right now in life? Is there a longing in your heart maybe for better relationships? If you're married, a, a better marriage, uh, not that it's not good right now, just something better that you see. Uh, maybe you're longing something inside of yourself in a, a career or something like that. You, you just you long for something a little bit better than what we have right now. And uh, I know that I, I get caught up in, in thinking about things that I see different in my life that I know that God has designed me for. It's not a selfish longing. I know what God has designed me for, and I see what he's designed me for, and there's a longing to go after that for something better in that. And oftentimes when I'm seeing what I'm longing for in the future, and I see the place that I'm in right now, there is a dissatisfaction. It's a, a straight up dissatisfaction. I often get sometimes angry, like, how come this is not happening right now? But there's just something that I know that's better for me. And when I get in that place of like this dissatisfaction, this this whatever, I get upset. Something that comforts me is to know that God cares for those things. He really does. He loves us immensely. And when the things that we long for that or want to be better in our life, they line up with the Word of God and His will. He really wants to bless us with those things. He wants to pour out those things to us. He wants to bring those fulfillments of our heart to fruition. And, and it's something that's so powerful to realize that God loves me so much that He wants these things for me because He's designed them for me. He truly has put them in my heart for a reason. And that's so powerful, and there's something even more powerful than that, is how much God cares for you and the desires of your heart. He longs so much more even for just your heart, just your heart. Get rid of all the things that you want, all the things that you desire. If you didn't have any ambition whatsoever, God says, I still love you because I want what's in your heart, and I want it without thinking that you need to go do anything because I look at you and I love you for who you are and anything that you think you need to go and, and do to get better. Like, no, I love you the way you are. I want you. And I want how you are right now to come on a journey with me because I do have better for you, God says. I do have better for you. Because we live in a fallen world and we live in a sinful world and we sometimes we go in and we mess up in life. And he wants to take us on a journey that we can go through life and there's a healing that takes place, there's a restoration that takes place, and we truly repent, meaning we, we look back at the things we've done before and we're not even going to focus on them. We're not even going to look at them anymore because we've got a new path ahead of us that God wants our heart. And when we go after the things that God wants in our heart and we're willing to expose our heart for God to come in, he's ready to pour out. Now, I don't know if you like, you're like me. I'm sometimes a professional dodger when it comes to like avoiding the things of God to come into my heart, to talk to me in my heart. And oftentimes, to be honest with you, I, I, uh, I do it with busyness. Like my, my avoidance with God is busyness. And I'll do things. I'll just put things together just so I can stay busy sometimes so I can avoid that conversation that God's been like, hello. It's been three weeks. You heard me three weeks. I know you heard me three weeks ago. I know it. I'm still here, by the way. I want to talk with you. I'm like, I'm busy, God. I'm busy. But even if I acknowledge, because I do, that I am busy and I and I be I am busy to avoid sometimes, that's honestly it's not enough. It's not enough just to acknowledge it. There needs to be something beyond that that says, I'm going to take action. I'm going to stop. And whatever it is that we're dodging God and we're avoiding him, and I'm going to stop it right now because God is after something much more than just our attention. He's after our heart. And in that heart, what he wants to do is he wants to bring transformation, total transformation, not just a little bit. He doesn't look at you and go, listen, we're almost there. It's good enough. I'm just going to take a break. Uh, we'll come back to you later, but hey, you'll get the job done right now. So you're about 75% of the way there. I'm just going to leave it be right now and call it good and go work on somebody else. But 
You're good the way you are. No, he's after the total transformation of our heart. And guess what? That total transformation of our heart leads to a fullness of joy, a fullness of joy that he wants to impart in us because when we're, when we're healed and when we're whole and when we're transformed into the image of his son more and more, there's a joy that wells up inside of us because there's a longing inside of us that if we're after God and the things of God, that that's a satisfaction that nothing else can give in that moment. And it's not just about behavior modification. Because behavior modification means I'm just trying, I'm, I'm doing my best, I'll, I'll take one thing. God's after a complete transformation, a lasting change. And I'll put it this way. He is after for you to be whole and holy. A wholeness and a holiness. And they work hand in hand. And this is what we're going to be talking about today when it comes to the Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit purifies. The Holy Spirit, he purifies. And, I, you know, when we think about purification, sometimes we think about the stripping down of what shouldn't be there. And sometimes we're like, oh, my gosh, he's going to come in. He's going to knock out sin. He's going to slap me across the face and knock sin out of my life and purify me. And it's, it, it's, it's much, much of a time it's not that way. because. What God is looking for is not just behavior modification so that we become more holy, but he's looking for a wholeness in our heart and a holiness. I'll put it this way. You cannot strive for and we cannot get holiness without a deep wholeness. And we can't can't experience a wholeness without a deep holiness. I'll say that again. We can't have what we're striving for in holiness without a deep wholeness inside of us, a healing that's taken place, and we can't experience and go after and, and have holy, uh, wholeness without a deep holiness. And I'll show you what I mean by going to God's Word this morning. If you've got your Bibles, if, you, if it's on your phone even, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 for a moment. And if you don't have it, uh, it'll be on the screen here. But go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and while you're turning there, Uh, And you've got your Bible in hand, and even if you don't, it'll be on the screen and just declare it right there. But just declare with me, this is my Bible. There we go. Let's try that again. One, two, three. This is my Bible. Bible. I am who it says I am, and I can do what it says I can do. Yes, let's just set up God's Word, the truth in it, and how it transforms us. We're going to go into verse 7 of chapter 12. We'll start there. And remember, we're talking about whole and holy, a wholeness and a holiness that God wants for us. I'm going to really focus in on the last verse, but it, it gives more context if we start in verse 7 here. It says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons or daughters. For what son or daughter is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. It's kind of harsh, but there's truth behind it. We'll get into this. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they, meaning our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he, meaning God, disciplines us for our good, that we may share his what? His holiness, that we may share his holiness. His holiness comes from the discipline in our life that he gives us. There's a disclaimer here that the writer puts in verse 11. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Amen to that. But watch, later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. And make straight paths for your feet, and here it is, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. So that what is lame may be not put out of joint, but rather healed. There's a discipline that God has for our life that he wants to purify us through. And it's it's a discipline that brings a holiness. But he doesn't care just about your behavior modification. He cares about your whole person, your whole being, and your heart, and your mind, and your soul. And he says, listen, check out your feet, your knees, the things that may be out of joint. Get ready, because there's healing coming. 
so that you can walk along these straight paths that I'm disciplining and bringing holiness in your life. There's something very powerful about that, that God wants to bring complete healing, complete restoration. This, this word healed is not like, oh, you're good 50% of the way. Oh, you're, you're almost there. That's good. No, no, it's talking about a complete healing that God has for you. And if you, if you want that, say amen. Amen to that. I want that in my life. I'll say hey, amen to that. So the Holy Spirit is going to take us through a purification process because the Holy Spirit purifies our life. And I'll set it up this way. And we've, we've talked about the word sanctification here and there in this series. And just to remind us of what sanctification is, when we are saved, we are immediately sanctified. And what sanctification means is that we are in right standing with God and we are brought to a place that when he sees us, he sees no fault in us. He sees nothing wrong with us. In short, he sees us the same exact way that he sees his son, Jesus. Jesus was a perfect man, faultless in every way. And so when we are sanctified, when we are saved, it's immediate. It happens. And we are looked upon by God in that way. Now, that's in the spiritual sense. Now, we have physical bodies, and we're here on earth, and listen, we're, we're full of flesh, we're full of, of sinful nature, and we do things that we look at ourselves and we go, well, I'm not there. How does God look at me and go that I'm there? So in the physical sense, there's a process that the Holy Spirit takes us through of sanctification while we're in these earthly bodies that brings us to a place that is whole and holy with God. It's like you can say, we're already but not there. Already sanctified in the spirit, but not quite there in the body. So the, the spirit, the Holy Spirit, takes us on this journey. And I'll show you what I mean by this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, we read, uh, But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. It's the spirit of God who washed you, who sanctified you, and who justified you. If we go swing over, and you can just look on the screen real quick, but Titus 3, 4, and 5, it says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. Thank you, Jesus. And get this, by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. The washing, the regeneration, the renewal. And we can just spend the rest of our time talking about those three words. Those are great. But this is the Holy Spirit bringing sanctification. This is the Holy Spirit purifying us so that we're brought to a place of wholeness and holiness in our life. And I'll, I'll, I'll look at an a image of being baptized. I don't know if you guys have ever been baptized where you've been dunked into water and you've been brought out of water. But what that is is a symbol of cleansing in our life, that we went down a certain way in our former life, and we've come up new in Christ. We are a new creation. We are a new person. And there's a cleansing, and there's a refining that takes place in the process that God takes us through. It's a cleansing of our heart to make us whole, and it's a refining of our thoughts to bring us to a holiness so that we think certain ways. We end up speaking those ways. We end up acting those ways. But if we go to Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, John the baptizer is about to say something that's very profound, and he says to the people who are out there, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we have this imagery of being baptized in water, cleansed, washed, set free. And then through the, the Holy Spirit coming, he's refining us through this fire, this process of refining that takes place. And one of the most simplest ways that I can try to explain that was really a blessing to me to help me understand more of this process of this cleansing and this refining that takes place is how gold is refined. And you've got some, some jewelry here that I'll, I'll take and, and get back. It's not really my style, but a little bling-bling action going on here. And thank you, Tiffany, for providing this. But we have some gold here. Now, I don't know if this is pure gold or if it's like 24-karat gold, but did you guys know that if it's not pure gold, something like 24-karat gold, it's actually only about roughly 37% gold? 
there's other metals, there's other things that are put in here, and it's it's shined on the outside with the 24 karat gold. So it's about 37% gold. And what you'll do sometimes if if you take your jewelry in to exchange it or to just give it whatever you're doing, give it away or pawn it off. And they want to extract the gold from it and just have only the gold. They'll take it through what's called a refining process. And this refining process is what they'll first do is they'll start washing it. Now, they'll use some chemicals and they'll use some, some different things to really just wipe away any impurities that are happening in that moment uh, that are on it and that have built up on it. And then they'll put it in fire. They'll put it in this fire. And this fire gets up to about 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. And, and the, the metals, they begin to melt inside of it. And what happens in that process, in that time, is that the impurities that were in here, the things that are not gold, they rise to the surface. And then in the container, there's some lead at the bottom, and, and the gold is drawn down to the lead, and it settles on the lead. And so there's a separation that occurs with the, the stuff that does not belong there, it's to the, risen to the top so they can scrape it away. And what's left is just some gold that's attached to some lead. So they'll take that out. And then they'll wash it again. They'll wash it, they'll purify it, they'll cleanse it, and they'll stick it back in the fire again. And this time the lead is being separated from it. And so by the time that's done and they take out the gold, it's about 90% pure gold at that point. But again... They'll wash it. They'll cleanse it. They'll wipe it down, and then they'll put it back in the fire again, and they'll refine it even more. And then at this point, what actually, it's a very unique thing that happens, but it, you take the gold out that point, and it's turned into what like, look like cornflakes. They look like cornflakes. It's, it's no longer this solid piece. They're kind of twisted around, and, and so they'll take those out of the fire. And again, they're going to wash it and cleanse it, put it back in the fire. And then what happens at this point is it actually turns into like this dust or this sandy dirt type looking thing. Like if you had like wet sand, kind of looks like that. But it is the most, at that point, pure form of gold there is. And you put it back in the fire and it turns into like these gold beads or nugget looking things. And that's how they, they harden it up at that point and they leave it at that point until they decide they're going to make something out of it. Say they're going to make a cross, or they're going to make a plate, or they're going to make something like earrings, and so they'll melt it, and then they'll pound it together. They'll they'll um, what's that word that you you're you're pounding it in? It's escaped my mind for the moment. But you welding, they'll weld it together to whatever image or thing that they're making, and it's just fascinating that you can look at something like this and it's beautiful on the outside. But if I told you it's only 37% gold and there's so much other stuff that really doesn't belong there. And this is our life with us walking around and doing what we do. We're, we're beautiful on the outside because we're made in the image of God. You were created to look like you look, to function like you function. God thinks you're beautiful. But because of what happens in our life, there's just some stuff that gets inside of us that's not the purity that God wants for us. And so he takes us through this process of refining us, and he'll wash us, and he'll cleanse us. And then sometimes he'll put us in the fire, and he'll begin to refine us. And it's so that the impurities begin to separate from what should not be there in our life. And he'll take us out, he'll give us a break, and he'll wash us clean again. And we'll go along in life, and he says, I'm not quite done with you yet, so I'm going to put you back in the fire, and I'm going to refine you. And this is not to, to hurt us in any way. It's to, like he said in Hebrews here, to discipline us, to take out the things that should not be there. But it's not just for that, it's to heal us along the way and to bring a wholeness to us that we could not get any other way. And I want to take us through God's Word and just as we kind of bring this to um, the final thoughts here today on how to bring application to all this, I want to bring us to God's Word and, and show the things that God wants to take us through and the journey He wants to take us on so that we're not just ending up being some holy person that's walking around like all proper, but there is something inside of us that is completely whole. It is healed. It is, it is perfect in every way because that's how God 
designed it for us. That how, that's how much God loves you that he wants to give that for you. So we're going to take a look through Galatians chapter 5, if you want to go through to there with me. I know we're somewhat familiar with the fruits of the Spirit, but let's just take a look here through a few verses here in chapter 5, starting at verse 16, and we're going to set up the fruits of the Spirit and how God wants to move to bring wholeness and holiness to our life, starting in verse 16. Paul says this, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's a promise. It's not a suggestion. It's a promise. If you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Meaning God has so designed his spirit to reside in you that you you get an alarm going off. I shouldn't be doing this. That's not for me. And he says, now there's something at war within you that says you should not do it. And he gives you his spirit to say that you're good enough. I've given you enough power that you, you have the discipline not to go there anymore. It says in verse 19, now the works of the flesh, they're evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. Come on, that's a long list. Drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. It's a long list. I warn you, as I did before, but those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But Opposed to that is the fruit of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Born again, you're saved. You have the Spirit in you. You live by the Spirit. We're called to walk with the Spirit. But he lists these nine things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He lists those nine things. And these aren't everything that God calls us to be and do. I don't think Paul sat down and was like, what are the nine things that if I put these nine things, is a complete Christian right here. These are things coming to his mind by the Spirit of God that he's telling us to strive for. There's many more things that we can strive for in life, but these are so important, and they really encompass the majority of life here. But if we look at these things, I want to break down a few of them to show how God wants to work a wholeness and a holiness as we walk by the Spirit in these things. So look at at your Bible. The first one that he talks about there, the spirit of the fruit of the spirit is love. Love. So I want to break it down into whole and holy when it comes to love. Now, when it comes to wholeness, I'll ask you this. Do you remember your first heartbreak in life? The first time that man or woman just shattered your heart and things were never the same again. That moment. And we've probably all been there in our life at some point. God bless you if you had the perfect person from the very beginning and you never experienced that. But a lot of us have. And even if it's not a relationship, maybe the first time that you were ever rejected by somebody you cared about and your heart was broken. Or maybe the first time that you didn't live up to the expectations that somebody had for you and you just feel down on yourself and there's something not right in your heart. There's something that's, that's not whole anymore. It's been, it's been broken. Do you go through life with a broken heart? heart. Do you go through life right now with a heart that is hurt, that is marred, that is scarred? Yes, God wants to bring holiness so that we line up our life with love and living out love, but he first wants to bring a wholeness to you in your heart. He wants to bring a healing in your heart. So so it's like he wants to bring you so much to a place of wholeness that you can go back to the before your even your heartbreak even took place. He loves you so much that he wants to restore your heart to where it was when you were first born, when there was nothing that got in the way of your heart. And it, you had a carefreeness about you that nothing was going to come against you and break your heart. He wants to take you back to that type of wholeness with your heart. Because through this wholeness and this healing that takes place in your heart, you're able to go love people properly according to God's word. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
if you don't have the wholeness and the healing in your heart for love that God provides for you and wants to give you, how can you properly go love somebody and show a holy life by living that way to love your neighbor as yourself? We, we often sometimes judge people, and we're not supposed to judge people. We're supposed to have a heart for people like Christ had a heart for people. But how, unless we are healed in our heart, can we love to that capacity? So God looks at the fruit of his spirit and says, more than just lining up in this holiness and this behavior and this rigid life that you have to be perfect and walk. No, I want to heal your heart so you have the fullness of the love that I have for you. And from the overflow of that, go love other people. Walk in the spirit and love that way. We can look at joy. Joy, and I'll be honest with you, out of all the fruits of the spirit listed here, joy for me? Uh -uh. Like. I, I, I'll be very vulnerable. Like, I, I resist joy. I straight up resist joy. And the reason I resist joy is because much of my life, I've come to a place of joy, and it's stolen just like that. It's stolen. It's gone. It's there for a fleeting moment in my life. And it's such a tender thing for me, and it's such a wonderful experience for me that when I sense it coming, I've had experience that it's going to leave very quickly. So I put up a wall and say, I don't even want it to come because I don't want the pain of it going. So we resent it sometimes. Do you resent joy? Have you, have you built something up in your life that blocks the, the true joy that God provides for us to come in? Because if we do that, we allow ourselves to be vulnerable to counterfeit joy. Not the true joy that God wants to give us. If we put a wall up that says, I don't want God's joy because I'm just afraid it's going to go away, we look and we go, well, that looks like fun. That looks joyful. And then that spirals into an addiction. Look at the, the joy I'm going to get in this relationship. I'm going to find joy in there. So I just pour everything into that. It's not the same joy that our Father wants to, to give us. And so there's this joy that God wants to bring that's a wholeness inside of us that breaks down those walls. And if we, if we look into the holiness factor of joy, you know, Jesus talking to his disciples before he's about to be handed over to uh, the Romans, he says to this, this to them in John 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be found in you and that your joy may be full, full. God doesn't do half measures of stuff. God isn't a, a God that just, oh, a little sprinkle there, and that looks good. It's not about that. When God gives, God pours out. He overflows. He gives it without measure. And so Jesus says this fullness of joy. He goes on a chapter later in 1622. He says this, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice. And get this. And no one will take that joy from you. No one will take that joy from you. That tells me that we've been given something that cannot be taken. It's a choice. It comes down to a choice. And in this walk of wholeness and holiness, when it comes to joy, God wants to heal in our hearts so that we can have an abundance of joy. It says, uh, in Psalm 16, 11, you have made known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God wants through his spirit to give you joy. He wants to heal joy in your heart. And get this, when we live and we walk out having the spirit of joy inside of us, it's so depraved in this world and it's so lost in this world that somebody's going to look at you, Anna, and go, oh my gosh, you have joy. Where did you get that from? You're so happy all the time. Like nothing gets you down. You're like, it's a spirit of joy. God healed me in joy. And he's brought this fullness of joy that can't be taken away. And I'm walking in it. You got to get healed in it. So then we can live in it. Last example here on this one, peace. Peace. And this is, I think this is a big one for our hearts. I think I can point at every person in this room and go, there's missing peace in our life. In some area of our life, there's missing peace in our life. And we think about the storms in life that come our way. 
If you've been in one, you remember it. If you're in one now, you sure know it. And you better believe that there's, there's going to be some storms that are going to continue to come in life. But peace should not be absent, absent in the midst of the storm. Jesus declared peace be still in the middle of the storm. In the middle of it, he declared it peace be still, and it was so. Now, we talk about, as an example here, like physical storms. You ever been in like uh, high winds, or maybe like a tornado or a hurricane or something like that? You've been in the middle of a hurricane? I'll tell you, I'll tell you my near hurricane experience. I was um, booked a vacation, first one in several years. Um, and I was going to go to Atlantis in the Bahamas by myself because I just need to get away. Um, never go on vacation to resort by yourself, though. That's just, when you get there, you're like, oh, that's just, that's just me. Okay. It gets boring after about two hours. Um, but bef- when I booked it, it was all good to go. Uh, but the week that I'm supposed to go, there's a hurricane in the Atlantic that started off, and it's tracking for Atlantis. <laughs> and so I'm watching it because I'm like, this is not cool. Like, I'm, <laughs> I don't got no insurance on my vacation. Like, <laughs> I didn't want to pay the $24.95 on that thing. Uh, I hope this misses it. And so I'm tracking it, and it looks like it's starting to veer off. And I had to kind of make a decision, like, I'm either going to go or I'm not going to go. Um, Because it still hasn't reached. It just looks like it's going to possibly turn away from the Bahamas and and go up north. And so I'm like, "Ah, who cares? I'm going. If it comes, it comes. Like, there'll be more entertainment. Um, I'm just going to go. And so I decided to go, and it's actually quite beautiful the first several days. And then the hurricane itself, it did end up going north. It wasn't, but it came by, and the very last day, it was about 200 miles away, but it was so stormy that day. 200 miles away from the actual hurricane, waves were pounding in 10 feet high. Winds were flying everywhere. It was dumping rain. This thing was so far off, yet it was so powerful that 200 miles away, I was feeling the effects of it. Storms in life are that way. They could be so far off, but they're so powerful. They could be on somebody else's life, but they're so powerful that they can get on your life. And there's a battle of peace that takes place. That God, in the the middle of a storm, whether we're feeling sad, depressed, anxious, angry, lost. I felt all those things in the middle of storms before and many more things. But he says, even if you feel those things, I have something for you that's more powerful than that, and that's the peace that I want to give you. And so we have to be willing in the storms of our life to look at our heart and examine our heart and go, you know what, God? I'm feeling all these different things right now, and they're overwhelming me, and this doesn't seem like it's going to pass, but I know that you have a peace for me. You've promised a peace for me. So in the middle of a storm, we make a choice or we don't make a choice. And choice number one is that we open our hearts and we let God expose what's coming at our peace so that he can insert peace in our life. Or choice number two is we ignore the things in our life going on um, that God wants to speak in our life. And we just continue to go through the storm and it's raging and we're just complaining all the time and we're hurt. God offers something for us to bring a wholeness. And he wants that holiness or the wholeness to be so sewn up in us, so firm in us, that in the middle of a storm, we have the peace. And we can walk as believers in the peace that he has for us. And that's a holiness. It is a holiness that in the middle of a storm that you can walk in peace. It means that I have matured in my life as a believer, and I'm walking so close with God that there's a holiness in that, that in the middle of a storm I can have peace. But first, he wants to heal it in your heart first before we can begin to walk it out. Does that make sense? That makes sense? Okay. So I've talked all about this. I think we got an idea of what it is for the wholeness and the holiness that God wants in our life. And to sum it up, I just want to give us four things real quick, real quick. I know we're getting hungry. My stomach's growling right now. Four things real quick of how we can become more whole and more holy in the things God wants for us. I'm going to go back real quick to a couple verses in Galatians 5. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. First thing, this is is a free point right here. 
recognize that there, there are things that are going to come opposed to you. Just, it's, it's, it's life, guys. There's going to be things that come against us. It's not a free pass that we get to go and just have a carefree life. There's going to be things. There's going to be stuff that happens that we've got to deal with. But are we, going to, are we going to allow God in that process to make us whole and holy through it? The first thing, walk by the Spirit. The first thing that we do is walk by the Spirit. It's so simple because it says in Galatians 5.16, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. I'll jump to Romans 12, 2 to, to complement that. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. It says before that, submit yourselves to God as a living sacrifice. Be vulnerable, be open, be exposed. And then God's going to come in. And he's going to look at you and go, I want to transform you, but are you willing to be transformed yourself? So we have to, if we're going to walk by the Spirit, something very practical that we got to do is we got to take inventory of what we're allowing to come in our life. And it's very simple. What music do you listen to? What things are you watching on TV? What are you allowing to come in your life to be exposed to? Because the things you're pouring into your life are going to come out of your life. And you're like, well, Ryan, that seems a little bit religious. Like, can I have a little bit of fun watching my show on Netflix? Up to you. Up to you. I'm not here to judge either way. I'm just saying I'm taking inventory right now in a very real way of what I'm exposing myself to and what I'm allowing to come into my life because I know that once it comes into my heart, it's going to work its way into these deep places of my heart that is going to settle down for a minute because that's how the, the enemy works. He's not going to be like, oh, here you go. I have something for you that's going to completely ruin your life. No, he goes in and he settles into those deep places of your life and he hides and he just sits and he waits for the perfect opportunity to come out and say, gotcha. You're going to act this way. You're going to think this way. Why? Because you ex we, we expose ourselves to things that should not be. I dare you. I dare you. Go on your social media accounts and look at the people who you follow and take inventory of that. And if they are not posting things that are reflecting the lifestyle of a follower of Jesus, unfollow. Un I'm going to challenge you guys in that. Like, Let's expose ourselves to the things that are going to bring wholeness and holiness. And allow God to work. If we're looking at stuff that we shouldn't be looking at, and we kind of just brush it off, well, that's just, you know, that's not that bad. I've seen worse. It's not that bad. We should never have that mindset. We're to walk in the Spirit. And if it's opposed to God, why are we partaking in it? And I don't want to seem super religious in that, but I, we need to bring accountability to this. And we need to be mindful of the things that we're exposing ourselves to because eventually it works our way in our heart. And in walking in the Spirit, also just ask God to renew your mind daily. God, renew my mind. Allow me to think your thoughts. Allow me to just get rid of old patterns of thinking and be renewed in what your word says over me in, the, in a practical way of renewing your mind. Ask God and read his word, because oftentimes what God says, he's already said in here, by the way. Second thing is make an active commitment. Make an active commitment, not just like, mm, you know what, I'm going to do this. Uh, Lorena, how many times have I said I'm not eating sugar in the past six weeks? Be honest, like a dozen, probably. Okay. Yesterday was a declaration, I'm not eating sugar again. And I went through a whole day and a half right now so far. Praise God. I'm not eating sugar. But is there an active commitment to follow up what the desire is? Because let me tell you something. We can have a desire for God to come in and to heal us and to make us more holy. But are we actually taking the steps to do this? Are we taking <clears throat> an act of faith and putting it to work? And something I wrote down in this is... Um, these habits, these tendencies, these, these desires, we must actively turn away from them, and we must put them to death. And that's a little bit out there, but it says in Colossians 3, verse 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetedness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. 
in these two you once walked when you were living in them. But now, but now you must put them all away. Put them away, put to death. Meaning that you're never going to go back to it again. It's like this. Have you ever bought new clothes before and you realize your closet's too full? So you decide, I'm going to get rid of my old clothes so I can get new clothes. Well, what do you do with them? Take them to Goodwill or maybe throw them out if they're just not worthy of Goodwill or something like that. The point is you completely get rid of them. You throw them away so that you do not look in your closet and go, that looks stained, but that's nostalgic. I'm going to wear that right now. We, we throw them away. And this is, this is the active commitment that we make as believers, is that, is that God so loves us that he wants to make us whole and holy in our walk with him, but we have to put to death. We have to get completely rid of and make an active pursuit for the things that God has for us. And it, it leads us into the third thing, which is put on your new self. Put on your new self. So we walk by the Spirit by renewing our mind. We've made an active commitment a choice to actually move forward. And now we're putting on the new self. Paul finishes up his his thought in Colossians 3, verse 9. He says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed. There's that word again, renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. So put on the new self. What does the new self look like? Once you begin the healing process, what does that new self? Well, uh, I've decided that you know what? My language hasn't been the best. I shouldn't be cussing around, even though everybody at my work cuss. I shouldn't be doing that. That's not a reflection of who I am in Jesus. So you know what? I'm going to put on a new self, and I'm not going to do that. That's what putting on. It's just a very practical thing. Once you make an active commitment to put on the new self, it's saying the old way is done. I put it to death, and so I'm trying on these new things. I'm trying on patience. Listen, we're going to stumble, we're going to fall. It's not going to be perfect from the very beginning, but you better believe the more we do this, the more we're going to be conformed to God and a holiness is going to come out of our life. And so the last thing here, and this is the big one I saved the best for last. Number four, be willing to go deep. Be willing to go deep. The first three were about sanctification when it comes to the holiness in your walk with God. Be willing to go deep has to do with your heart and the work that God wants to do to bring a wholeness in your heart. A wholeness that, honestly, we can't even begin to comprehend because we've been so marred, and it's been so long since we've been healed in certain areas of our life that we don't even know what that looks like anymore to be completely whole. But God has that available for us, and and if we're willing to go there, if we're willing to be whole, if we're willing to get before God and be completely vulnerable with Him, it is painful, guys. And it is shocking sometimes to look in a mirror and go, this is who I've become. That's not what I want. And then God says, this is what I have for you. And if we rip open our chest and open our heart and we are willing to become vulnerable with God and sit in Him and with Him in these painful places, He begins to speak to us. He begins to work on us and He begins to, to do things that we can't do ourselves. Listen, I I go to a a therapist and a counselor. It's probably the greatest earthly thing I've ever done for myself. But there are things that he still cannot do that only God can do with me. That God will reveal certain things to me. If being vulnerable is new for you, like it was new for me a few years ago, tied up, sewed up, not exposing nothing in my life, no vulnerability here, go read the Psalms. David and the author of the Psalms were very vulnerable in their expression with God. I want to give you a a, a short peek at this and just realize the vulnerability in these verses. Maybe even close your eyes and let me read this over you. And just focus in on the vulnerable words that are taking place. This is David writing this when he's in the cave hiding from Saul because Saul wants to kill him. He says, with my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell him my trouble before him. And when my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, there is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord. I say to you, you are my refuge. You are my portion in the land of the living. 
Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. And bring me out of prison, that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. Amen to that. There's a vulnerability that these authors had in these psalms, and they would often write out these psalms where it was at first this cry, and then this plead, and then there was this praise at the end on what God would do for them. And reading over these will allow us to get a, a glimpse of what it means to be vulnerable with God. We've got to let go of the pride. We gotta, we've got to become humble in what God wants to work in your heart, because if we don't allow that to happen, these other things that we want to live out in our life, we're going to stumble along the way. We might eventually get there and living out a life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all those things. But when we're whole, when we're made completely whole in our heart, the holiness will come out in such a pure way. And it'll transform our hearts and our minds in ways that we cannot comprehend. The Holy Spirit is here to purify our life.